become a good friend. I have the utmost admiration for this young man. And for you folks who are listening on audio, we're also available on YouTube. It's Rick Gaiman. Rick, what's going on? Welcome to the On The Mark podcast. Mark, I'm excited. Yes, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is, this is going to be a lot of fun. Well, yeah, you know, you speak of a little fun, you know, we've worked together on the, a lot of fun. We've worked together on the CBS First Cut podcast for a while. And I wouldn't say we came from different poles as we approached, you know, golf, but we kind of did in a little way. But, but what I've loved about our relationship as we got to know each other better is we've sort of begun to meet in the middle. And I think there's a lot that folks can learn from this podcast, but before, before we get into that and the nitty gritty of golf betting, um, People want to know because this is a golf tip seeking audience. Tell us about you. How did you come to where you are? Yeah. So my background is in uh, what we would call big data. Uh, I worked in marketing automation, uh, which is really just a giant database mark. And, and I helped uh, college and pro sports teams sell tickets. So you're in, you're in Georgia. You know, if, uh, if you were a Georgia Bulldog season ticket holder, you know, you'd be marketed to in a specific way based on how much you spend and how much you donate. And uh, that was, that was kind of uh, what I was doing, working out of big databases. And obviously, you know, my passion for sports, my passion for golf specifically has always been there. And I kind of said, you know what, I can, I can build a, a, a database of, of golf stats. I can, I can do this. And then, uh, I started creating a, a giant database on the side, Mark, everything from round by round scores and hole by hole. And every round guys have ever played on the PGA tour and the European tour and all of this stuff that you could possibly imagine. And one thing leads to another and it becomes a, a, a full-time career uh between the the golf data website and between content that's what my database <laughs> looks like there by the way. <laughs> it's the yellow legal pad for the folks listening on audio hey i mean rick this was obviously a labor of love yeah that now has turned into who you are rickrungood.com yeah uh talk about the metamorphosis of this whole thing yeah so uh when it really turned from a just a database to a website. Uh, it was just for me, Mark. I, I've always done this just for me. I, I enjoy it. I like the the data side of it. You know, I obviously am going to make bets. I'm going to put fantasy lineups in, but I love the research process. I like knowing what types of golfers there are. Every single course is different every single week. That presents different challenges. So I just like the process. So when I created it, uh, on a, I put it on a website for myself so that I could get access to it anywhere. If I was on my phone or if I was out of town or whatever, I had access to it. And then I started letting my, you know, my buddies have access to it. And then they said, Hey, maybe you should charge for this. And I said, okay, maybe I should charge for this. And one thing kind of leads to another. And then luckily, uh, market grew, uh, it grew enough to the point where my wife and I, who you've met, we sat down and we had the conversation. Hey, can I, can I do this full time? Is this, is this a real thing? And she's been, uh, very supportive, uh, as, as I could only have, have, have hoped. And, I made the leap a couple of years ago and haven't looked back since. Well, here's the thing, folks. Um, the database uh, and Rick's wife, Armina, moved him to San Diego, <laughs> but now the database has moved him to Las Vegas. That's right. Which is the gambling capital of the world. So it speaks to what this stuff is. And, and you shared a cool little anecdote over dinner a few weeks ago where you spoke of the fact that... Um, with the website growing and with the COVID lockdown, all of a sudden, this thing just hit the accelerator in a big way. Tell the story. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, you know, the last couple of years and especially during lockdown in March, uh, you know, February, March, April, 2020, I mean, it, it was, it was a horrible time. We didn't know where the business or any business was going, but, uh, what ended up happening, Mark, as you know, when, when golf was really one of the first sports back, um, everyone was looking to watch golf on television. Everyone was looking to follow some type of sport, uh, place some wagers on it, maybe enter some fantasy lineups. And that was a real inflection point for the website because those people never left. And, and I think it's noteworthy because once people start getting into the game of golf, learning the personalities, I think they really start 
picking their favorite golfers. They pick who they're, they want to back. It's like finding a sports team. And uh, the one thing that I think is unique about golf um, compared to wagering on any other sports is that you can get almost a full season's worth uh, in four days. I'll give you an example, Mark. You know, you're, you're Atlanta Falcons, uh, 80 to one to win the Super Bowl uh, this year yeah. here in 2021. If you made that wager, you're waiting four or five, maybe six months for that outcome, that result to come through. In golf, it's happening over four days. So it, it ends up being a very appealing uh, sport that people usually don't want to you know, stop watching. <laughs> Well, now um, it's in the United States, certainly for our global audience, <clears throat> but it's being legalized in more and more states. It's becoming a thing on the European tour. Certainly it's been happening for a while with the folks over there in Ladbrokes and, and Betfair and those folks. But now in the US, it's now becoming legal and the PGA tour is embracing this and it's <laughs> the, the snowball thing is happening. Uh, and and the show that I'm on with you, we spend more time um, giving advice, prop bets, all this sort of stuff. I'm learning about it as we fly. And I'm sort of picking sometimes my favorites. And I don't have the insights that you do that you're going to share momentarily. But I guess what I'm trying to say is it's now real. And I'm not going to advocate to someone, hey, hey you got to do what Rick does and sort of get right. into gambling and wagering full time. But it's fun to be involved in a little league with your buds, like the one and done league that we do. Mm -hmm. Or if you have the quick flutter once in a week and you you go some little prop bet or whatever the case might be. So let's start there. Okay. This is this this is golf wagering 101. Help us for because I'm sure there are folks listening to this that have never done this and they've sort of been had their interest peaked. Start us off at the very start, please. Yeah. So, uh, and I think you're this, the great segue into that, Mark, is that uh, in a lot of respects, uh, gambling on golf or gambling and golf do go hand in hand quite a bit, whether you're it's five dollars on the course with your buddy on this hole, or as you mentioned, you know, uh, you could you could probably walk into a dozen places within a, a, a pitching wedge of St. Andrews and make wagers on the event that's going on. I mean, this is this has been happening globally for a long time. So I think, you know, golf betting 101 starts with picking who's going to win the golf tournament. That is what in our industry is called an outright bet where you just say, here's the field for this week. Here's the tournament. I'm going to pick the winner. And, and that is exciting, Mark, because uh, those odds are usually very long odds. Even uh, the favorites, even uh, John Rahm at uh, the Masters might be 10 to one. So if you put down $10 and he wins, you get a hundred dollars back. So those are very enticing bets because all you're rooting for is one guy and the odds are very long. I want to stop you there for a second because um, for the global folks, they know 10 to one or three and a half to one or five to three or whatever the case might be. But in the United States, the odds <laughs> are listed differently. And it took me a little while to figure that out. So please help folks. Yeah. So they are listed uh, American style of listing odds. So 10 to one would be plus 1000, which uh, what it does is it levels the playing field and says uh, every wager is a hundred dollars. So uh, for John Rahm, he, him being 10 to one, it would be plus 1000. If you bet $100, you would receive 1000 in return. And obviously those got odds go up and up from there. Um, but yes, we, we, we translate them differently across the globe. Yeah. <laughs> So, and so the outrights are those kind of things where you're like, okay, it's kind of like trying to hit the lottery. You're going to put 10 bucks down or whatever the case might be. And who knows? Maybe you get lucky that week. And that's exactly right. And we see it all the time in golf. I mean, uh, Cameron Champ, when he won last summer, was 110 to one. I mean, there's there's really few other sports in which you can get a return that large in such a short period of time. So these are very enticing bets. And yes, this is not, um, you know, in other sports, if you were a, a professional football uh, NFL better, uh, you'd be trying to win 55% of your bets. And over time, that would be enough in golf. You need to win significantly less than that because the odds are so much larger. So yeah, it is more akin to a lottery ticket. Okay. So that's the outright bet. Um, now I've lived in London long enough. You, you speak of little betting shops there, mm -hmm. pubs and betting shops. And, and you go in there and it was like Disney world for me, because like you, a lot of horse racing and stuff, and there's all these different things you can take. I can't think of the names right now. So in golf, you got your outright where you pick your winner. Um, let's work from there a little bit. 
until we get down to some of the fun stuff. So what's next? Yeah, so absolutely. So your outrights, uh, whoever's going to win the golf tournament, that is an easy transition into who's going to finish inside the top five, top 10 and top 20. So for example, if you think, uh, you know, Brian Gay, who, you know, might not win this golf tournament, but he can finish inside the top 20, there are odds that you can get on that. So that's kind of the natural progression for the finishing position bets. And then the the next, uh, I guess, segment of betting would be matchups, Mark. So this is where you can say, okay, here's two golfers, uh, one versus the other. I think John Rahm is going to beat Bryson DeChambeau at the Masters this year. I can place money on that, and I can not only do it for all four rounds of the tournament, but I can do it for round one, for round two, round three, and round four individually. Hey, um, this is this is where, folks, <laughs> for the folks watching me now, I'm hanging my head somewhat. So I get on this first cut show with Rick and Kyle Porter and Jonathan Coachman, who, who is very much into uh, wagering yep. and stuff as well uh, across, across all sports. And our producer and and, and um, Greg Ducharme is on there as well, who knows his stuff. And there's all this DFS speak, which I want you to talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. But then there's the thing too, where when I go for these matchup bets, because I normally do that or nationality bets or whatever the case might be, somewhere in my soul, I cannot go for a minus thing because I've seen matchups where it might be Rick versus Mark and Rick's minus 110 and Mark's minus 120. And I'm like, uh, this doesn't make any sense to me. So please help the folks there. Right. So when you start getting closer to, uh, you know, 50, 50 odds, it's either this guy or this guy, uh, there is going to be a golfer that's going to be a favorite. So those minus odds that you're referring to Mark, uh, that is going to indicate who is actually the favorite. So you could have a situation where John Rahm is minus 125 and Bryson DeChambeau is plus 110. So what that would mean is if you want to bet on Bryson, if you bet $100, uh, you would return and win $110. But for John Rahm, who is favorited to win, who the odds makers are expecting to win, you have to pay a little bit more for that. So what you would do is you'd bet 125 minus 125 to win 100. So it's all based off that $100 bet, but it is odds makers using whatever models they're using, or really just trying to balance the money to say, here's who we think is actually the favorite. Here's who we think is actually going to win. <laughs> if you watch my betting card then, and I'm not betting folks, this is advising folks in the other show. I will never have a minus bet on there. But now that I've learned a bit more, this is self-serving some, <laughs> I'm not going to bear that in mind. Okay, so so those are matchups where it's just a plain head-to-head. Yep. -head. Hey, there's situations where there's group bets or there's threesomes as well uh, that you can bet on. You end off, right? <laughs> That's right. So, so generally the, the threesomes or three balls, what they'll do is usually on Thursday and Friday, uh, when, when the golfers go out in threesomes, it'll just be the golfers at that tee time, which is really nice because they're all playing together. They're playing the course and the holes at the same exact time. You're not worried about weather changing or anything like that. So those are generally pretty nice and easy to follow. But then after that, it is just, um, you know, a spider's web. You can go in any direction here. Mark, you mentioned the nationality bets. You could every, Every single week you could you could bet who is the top Asian, top South African, top Englishman, uh, and really anything you want in terms of, of nationality bets. And, and some weeks, you know, this, there might only be two Irishmen in the field, or there might be eight Englishmen. So it's kind of a, a unique way to look at it. And it's fun because, uh, you know, to be the top Irishman mark out of a, you know, uh, one or two other golfers, uh, you might only need to finish 45th. You don't have to win the golf tournament. You don't have to do that. You just have to beat your other countrymen. What happens if both players in a bet like that, three players, four players, if all of them miss the cut, is there still a payout for the low guy? So this will all be based on, so uh, each book will treat this differently, but in general, if they all miss the cut, uh, the player with the better score. Uh, so if you were three over and you missed the cut, but everyone else was five over and they missed the cut, the three over would win. Some books would just refund that and say, this is, this is a no bet. Nobody made the cut. So there, it is a little bit of house rules. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so that's the fun part of it. Now let's get into the, <laughs> the, the DFS thing, which yes. stands for daily fantasy. I don't know what even what the S sports. <laughs> All right. So off you go, please have at it. Okay. So this is, um, this is a whole nother animal. This is like wagering on steroids. And this became very popular really probably six or seven years ago. And what this asks you to do is create a fantasy 
lineup. Um, so if you were playing for the NFL, you would pick a quarterback, two running backs, two wide receivers. Now in golf, Mark, we don't have positions, so it's actually a lot easier. You just pick six golfers. And these are the six golfers that you are going to roll with in your lineup uh, for the tournament. And they are uh, scored differently. They're not scored exactly the same as they would be on the PGA Tour, Mark, because um, it, birdies are very, very valuable in fantasy. So for example, on the PGA Tour, if you make two birdies and two bogeys, uh, you are even par your, your, your pat. Uh, but if you do that in fantasy scoring, because birdies are much more valuable uh, than the, the points that you lose when you make a bogey, it's actually more valuable to make nine birdies and nine bogeys instead of 18 pars. So it's like a, a different, it's a different animal. And then when you add up all the points, if you, if you know, if you have more points than the person you're playing against, you win. And you talk about the six golfers. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a certain amount that you get to spend? Because uh, there's values ascribed to each player, correct? Correct. Right. Yeah. So this is this is really the big strategy. So um, all of these fantasy sites, they will give you a salary cap. Generally, fifty thousand dollars to spend or sixty thousand dollars to spend. We'll we'll use an example for fifty thousand here. And the top players, uh, the best players in the field, your John Roms, your Rory McIlroy's, your Justin Thomas's, they're going to cost somewhere between ten and eleven thousand. Um, so when you start doing the math, you realize you cannot just purchase the six best golfers in the field. You're not going to have enough money to do that. So what you really have to do is be strategic and say, okay, well, um, I want to, I definitely want to have Rory McIlroy in my lineup. So I'm willing to pay for him up there, but you know, I've got to look down the board and find some of these sleepers, find some of these long shots. Cause I can only spend $50,000 across these six guys. And in terms of laying these wagers, it's all sort of the same drill for anyone who's doing it online, unless they're going into a sports book, right? You, you get on whatever website it is and, and you have at it. Yeah, correct. And there's, uh, of course, different contests. Uh, I could play you, you know, you versus me, and we each pick six golfers and uh, for ten dollars, and whoever wins gets the other guy's ten dollars. Or you can get into larger contests. These are the ones that you usually see with the marketing and the promotion, where you know you it's ten dollars to get in. There's, th you know, fifteen thousand other people, and first place is. 10 grand or 20 grand or something like that. So there's different ways you can get involved. So it could be a weekly thing. It could be a season long sort of a deal as well. Then. Yeah. Or, and now it can even be round by rounds. I mean, you could, you could set lineups just for a single round of tournament golf and they're expanding to, you know, the European tour and the champions tour and the LPGA and corn Ferry tour. So it's, it's really no shortage of options, Mark. <laughs> getting next year and I know just enough to be dangerous um, <laughs> broadcast side of things the tour the pga tour this is that is has been experimenting with just pure par three coverage mm -hmm. so it sounds to me like they can have like you can gamble on the par three with your whoever whoever the sports book is and said all right of this twosome joe blow is going to miss the green and you put a little something on it is this a reality yes and that is definitely where uh, golf wagering is headed. And we've seen this in other sports too. It, you know, you start uh, uh, with a wager on the outcome of the game or the match, and then it says, okay, well, how about on the first quarter? And then how about on this play or how about on this shot? So it gets, it gets more and more micro. And that ends up being um, a data discussion, Mark, because the data has to come in quickly enough for these sports books to say, okay, they're stepping up to the third tee. This is a par three have the odds ready so that people can bet it in real time. So that's definitely the future. Uh, there are not many books that are out there offering that on a weekly uh, basis, but for your, for your larger events, that's available right now. And as we get more mature in this industry, it'll be more widely available. It's crazy because these are called prop bets. Am I correct? Is that the correct vernacular? Yes. Right. Yep. Short for propositions. Uh, okay. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> a couple of years ago when CBS was doing um, the Super Bowl, I think it was the one in Atlanta. Um, obviously, Jim Nance is a colleague of ours, and we're sitting at dinner a few nights before, and he's announcing, so he can't give advice, but he's scrolling through his phone, <laughs> and there's some website where you can get crazy prop bets. And there was some bet, because you know how Jim opens every show, hello, friends. Mm -hmm. Sounds a lot cooler when he says it <laughs> compared to me, hello, friends. Um, and the odds were ridiculous. And he goes, well, I'm going to say that you may as well take the bet, <laughs> but, but it was ludicrous, but the bet was on there. And that goes to show that if you're scrolling around on these places, it, who knows what you'll find. 
Uh, yeah, and especially for uh, the Super Bowl is the perfect example because that's the mecca. The 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 wagering options are huge in our world. That's the Masters. When the Masters comes around, you could wager on almost anything. Uh, I mean, the types of uh, shirts that some of these guys are going to wear. I mean, it's it, it really is crazy. So it's not as mature where we're there on a weekly basis yet, Mark. But um, yes, for 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 large events, there is seemingly endless options to scroll through. So you're the expert. Do you do those kinds of things or are you just pure golf betting? Yeah. So a lot of those are very random, right? I don't know what color Gatorade is going to be dumped on the winning coach at the Super Bowl. And I don't have the data to back that up. So, so generally speaking, I, st- I try to avoid those and stick to the much more, uh, you know, natural plays. <laughs> All right. You take it. You, you're doing the perfect hosting rule there because that is the ideal segue <laughs> to get into Rick run good because everything you do, and this is what I've appreciated about you. Everything that every call you make is essentially data driven, right? Now, I know I've had a little bit of I've massaged you a little bit of a way, and, and now you're looking a little wider than that. But you have this website, and I'd like you to put it up on the screen so people can see it. And then we can just talk about how you handicap players. Because for me, if you want to go ahead and try and share that, you can do your thing there. Yes, um, there we are. That's rickrungood.com. R I C K. Um, R-U-N-G-O-O-D.com and you can go there and subscribe. It, it is just a treasure trove of stuff, people. I, I cannot tell you. Um, where I will sort of look at who's playing momentum. I look at momentum. I look at horses for courses. Uh, I Then that's about where I, I, I end. And then sometimes I'll go with my gut. You do that a little bit more now than what you used to but you've got Mm -hmm. all this other stuff where you can create filters Mm -hmm. you can have your website essentially spit out let's say this golf course rewards great iron play and i'm look we're looking yet el chameleon for the folks on audio that's this week at the maya coba event in 2021 and rick even has a filter for the type of grass they're playing on over there oh yeah so you can go scrolling through all the past palom events and find out who's done well on that surface. So, so have at it, my boy. Off you go. Yeah. So uh, you're absolutely right. Everything that I do is data driven. But obviously, uh, you know, you and I getting getting much more, uh, you know, uh, closer together in our views. I think what you kind of helped me realize is that. You know, it can be a little bit more random than you think it is, right? It's not all data. Sometimes these guys wake up with a a sore back, or sometimes you know they found something on the driving range that is never going to show up in my data. So, uh, you know, I I I love the data, but uh, there's obviously much more to it. So, um, what you're seeing here on on my website right now, yes. So this is basically where I would probably start. The the one unique aspect of golf, Mark, and you know this, of course, is it's a different golf course every single week. You know, when it's, when it's basketball or football, uh, it's always going to be the same playing dimensions. They're, you know, basketball, they're always indoors. That's not happening here. So what I have um, is, and I call this the course key stats tool, is basically a data-driven calculation that shows what types of golfers, Mark, are have found success at this course. So for El Chameleon, we have a great history there. We've been going there for 12, 13, 14 years, something like that. And uh, based on the stats of every golfer uh, that has ever played here, we can start to see the trends. And it's probably no surprise that driving accuracy has been very closely correlated to success over the last dozen years, because this is a course that, as you know, Mark, you have to play out of the fairway. Yeah. Well, for the folks who aren't on knowing and, and and i'm looking at this website for the audio listeners and do go to the youtube um version of this the vodcast so you can see because it's fascinating i mean there's like a spider web grass that's breaking down strokes gain total t to green putting the whole thing and then you've got players ranked and then you've got you can filter the website and stuff and right it's distance from the edge of the fairway there, there's all sorts of numbers Yeah. So what I would generally do is I would look at this first and I would say, okay, what types of players are we looking for, for this week? And then I would flip over to, you know, any one of these other, um, any one of these other tools here. So this is the one that, that you were referring to. So I call this the Holy grail mark because I don't have a better name for it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I like that, but I just wanted to build on what you said about El Chameleon. I mean, for the folks who aren't familiar with it, it's a golf course built on, on, uh, in, in the Mexican Riviera, basically. And there's mangroves and stuff everywhere. And if you miss the fairway, it's essentially a penalty shot because you're in the mangroves or in an unplayable area. There are some sort of waste bunkers, if you will. 
So driving accuracy is important. And so Rick is able to filter it down to see, okay, who are the accurate drivers? Now, this is where I want your quick take, Rick, because this is where golf is variable, okay? Yes. So all of a sudden, Wednesday evening before the event, and the golf course normally rolls out a little bit with a paspalum grass, but they got dumped on, it was wet, they played lift clean in place, so it was a set, like hitting darts to a dartboard off the tee. So it mitigated driving accuracy, and all of a sudden, as I watched it, it became a situation where guys who putted slow greens were doing better, and guys who were able to really hit their irons the right distance because the greens were like dartboards too. So th that was that weird sort of thing that maybe is the immeasurable as, as I watched round one. Correct. There are certainly going to be things that uh, I'm not going to be able to throw into the model that I'm not going to be able to throw into the calculations that you just have to start using common sense at some point. And, and, and you're absolutely right there, Mark. And here's, so here's the Holy grail. So this is where I have uh, every single round played by every single player on the PGA tour <laughs> dating back to 2010. So this will go back a little bit further. I'm just, I just have to load in the last uh, six years of strokes game data. <laughs> okay, you got to stop for one second because now everyone's, all right, what's the subscription? How much is it per month for this lot? $19.99 a month. Uh, yeah, that'll get you access to it, this and, and everything else. But yeah, it is a, a pretty sizable, I would argue, Mark, probably one of the larger golf databases that are, that are probably out there at the moment. Mm, yeah, I, I know this because the PGA Tour is very interested in what Rick's doing, as are all the places in Las Vegas. Hey, um, so all you guys who want to win the win your little fantasy league or whatever, get this thing. You'll be empowered. Talk us through what we're seeing over here, please. Yeah, so this is this is really where you have all the control here. So this is every round um, by every single player for the last 11 years or so. And now I'm going to start diving into this. So after I've learned, okay, El Chameleon, I'm looking for accurate drivers. Maybe I also want to get um, uh, guys who play well on Paz Palum. That's a very unique grass. We only get it a couple of times a year. So as you mentioned, Mark, I can filter this data really any way. So I'm going to just first load this and just say, let's start with Paz Palum greens. Um, now there are, there are definitely unique situations because the PGA tour does not take the shot link lasers yeah. to this course, which yeah. is how you get the strokes gain metrics for putting. But what I can easily do is look at the best golfers uh, in this field on Paz Palum over the last 10 years. And you quickly start to see, so I can see, you know, Shane Lowry's gained two and a half strokes around. That's a lot, but he's only played four rounds. Justin Rose, he's also up there only four rounds. I start to look at someone like this. Emiliano Grillo, yeah. who has played 10 different events in his PGA Tour career on Paz Palum. He has never lost strokes to the field. He has never finished worse than 41st. He's piled up top 15s. Now, even though I don't have the strokes gain putting metrics, Mark, this might be something that for Emiliano Grillo, when he gets on this surface, which is generally by an ocean or somewhere shorefront, uh, he tends to play well. Now I'm starting to build the types of golfers that I'm interested in this week. Yeah. Um, and as I'm looking down the list here on Paspellum, incidentally, folks who went Lowry, Adam Long, Justin Rose, Ricky Fowler, who's playing well yep. this week, Victor Hovland, who won here last year. Uh, yep. that, that's in 2020. Scotty Scheffler and then Grillo. Now, you talked about the finishes, the, the, the grid I'm looking at, the folks on YouTube can see. It's got, I don't know what, DK dollar. What, 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 what? Uh, that's the DraftKings. That, so on DraftKings, that would be his price this week. Okay, so that changes every week then? Yes, it does. Wow, gee whiz. Again, <laughs> folks, 1999. Uh, then you've got rounds, numbers, off the tee, strokes gained, approach, um, I can see around the greens and putting. Uh, what's the BS? Yes. So I'm so glad you asked this, Mark. So uh, the PGA Tour gives us, you know, this, I have a, a, an agreement with the PGA Tour. They send me the official data. We can manipulate that though, just a little bit. So what we do in our world, um, so the, the PGA Tour does strokes gained by four different categories, off the tee, approach, around the green and putting. Uh, what we do or what I do is I combine off the tee and approach and I call that ball striking. Uh, okay. So that's, that's just off the tee plus approach. And then around the green and putting, you combine those for short game. 
So I expand this out to two more different stat categories. So BS is not what Carl Porter was speaking <laughs> on the latest podcast. Right? <laughs> it, it, it technically is, but just a different uh, stands for something else. <laughs> yeah, Carl is very much a ball striking guy. So I'm sure that's his favorite, uh, favorite statistic. Above this little grid, and there's more down below it, um, there's strokes gained by round, and then there's fantasy data as a yeah. as a tab. What is that? Yeah, so this is much more um, uh, prevalent for those who are playing DFS, those who are playing fantasy, because this is again a different a different type of scoring. So the way that I break this out is is much less in the strokes gained metrics and more into how many birdies per tournament is a golfer making? How many pars are they making? Um, there's a stat called bo uh, birdie streak, Mark. So if you make three birdies in a row uh, on the PGA Tour, that's just worth three birdies. In fantasy golf, that's worth a lot more. You get a bonus for that. So as you can imagine, some golfers make birdie streaks more than others. And some guys uh, make more bogeys than others. So this is all this type of stuff that comes into it. Hey, audio listeners, a little <laughs> insider of you. This website's got to be huge because Rick's looking off to his left. <laughs> and that tells me he's got one huge computer screen off to his left-hand side where he's looking at this. So so the numbers I'm looking at are the 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 DK or DraftKings, I guess. Yes, yes. Tournament yep. rounds in there's eagles, birdies, pars, bogeys, double bogeys, birdie streak, bogey yeah. free round, bogey free rounds. Then the yep. points, points gained. This is nuts, man. Oh, goodness gracious me, this yeah. is a full time job for you. Well, it certainly is. And, and, and all of this. So right now I just have, you know, I'm just showing the default last four or five years, but you could look, okay. Cause you know this, Hey, maybe I only, only want to look at every golfers, uh, last six months or just this season or just the last 50 rounds. It's really, um, my goal on this whole thing, Mark is to present the data, but allow you to look at what you think is important, what the data thinks is important, make your own decisions, really just help with the research process because you know this, there's so much data, you could really get bogged down with it. I just try to make that process as easy as I can. So when you are, because Rick does an awesome job also, folks, if you watch him on social media where he will give um, who you who you fading for the week, which is yeah. betting parlance to say I'm not interested, mm -hmm. and then who you're playing. So I guess this week, the folks you're fading are folks that are just down your list, perhaps. Yeah. You're playing uh, who are up your list data-wise. Yeah, correct. So there are certainly guys that, um, you know, sometimes I'll look at, um, you know, specific types of, of fields, right? So you look at this week, you know, Justin Thomas, as great as he is, he hasn't always been very accurate. I, you know, I, I'm kind of lukewarm, lukewarm on him, someone that I might not want to invest in. But generally speaking, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find golfers that are playing well at the moment, uh, golfers that have either played at this course well or should fit the course. So those are two different things, Mark. We some some people will use course history and course fit interchangeably, but to me, they're completely different course history. You've actually played at this course before and you've played it well, or you haven't, whatever that is, it's your history or course fit is more like, I know the type of golfers that should play well here. And this golfer matches that type of skill set. That to me is course fit. And once I start narrowing those golfers down, I can find golfers that I'm interested in golfers that I'm not interested in. You just sort of described how I go about picking players because I don't have access to this website. <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to pay my $20. For you. <laughs> so I can get your promo code. <laughs> I think. Hey, um, because when I go and I look at this and when we, before we have the preview show on a Tuesday afternoon, uh, you can go and find it wherever you download your podcast. Look for first cuts. Um, I look at, I sort of, I'll go through the history if I have time and see who's played well there, but I also have the luxury of having been there for a while. Yeah, and I sort of know the guys and they, I can sort of remember them now at 51 years young, maybe they'll go away and I need a website a bit more, but the course fit is a big deal too. So is there anything else you want to show here? Cause it's so cool. Or can we quickly test you out a little bit and, and give you an event for the future and you can give us a little bit of a prediction? Sure. We could do that. One thing that I would, that I would say is most people start here. Uh, this is the cheat sheet mark. So this is really, I try to make this, um, it's a lot of data in one spot, but really what it allows you to do is look at recent events. So you can see, you know, here are the last six to eight events and every golfer's finishing position right next to their history. So this would be very easy for people to identify, oh, Tony Finau, He's played here four times in the last five years. He has a 16th and eighth, two missed cuts. So this is a very easy way to start kind of 
picking through, seeing golfers who are playing well and seeing golfers who have uh, played well at this course. This is generally where most people start. You know what? I, I talked about horses for courses. It's the first thing I look for because the one thing is a PGA Tour instructor. And I guess this is the golf instruction segment of this podcast. Um, you know, top golfers, just like you folks listening, they go ups and they they're slumps and they go downs. And if someone's coming in here with a number of missed cuts in a row, I'll be sort of low on the individual because I know likely what's going on behind the scenes and they not, might not be playing free or might be trying to work something new in or changing clubs. There's all these other elements that are brought to bear. So, so having that history, the last few events played, and then also the, the history at this golf course is a really good tool. Yeah. All on the same line. So it makes it easier for me to be able to identify, um, you, what do you, what do you want to do? We want to do a test here. Should we, should we figure this out <laughs> before, before we go there? Um, because I want, um, what are we, I've got to date this because the podcast lives in the internet. So we are in early November, 2021. Mm -hmm. If you're listening to this in 2022 or beyond. And in a couple of weeks time, we are going, coming back to my home state. Uh, here in Georgia, and we're going to Sea Island for the RSM Classic. Now, I'll tell you right now who I got my eyes on because I've watched them play there before, but I'm keen to see what your golf course will, or what your database will spit out. So Rick's typing in their Sea Island Resort Seaside, which is only yep. half the story because they play another golf course there, Tyrion Plantation. Correct. Around. But that's yep. beside the point. I'm being a bit picky. <laughs> And I'm looking at it, folks, and it says you Bermuda grass, Harry Colt. It's even got the designer, the yardage, the average green size. My Lord, man, this is unreal. And yeah. Okay, off you go. So, so there's a couple of things that stand out to me. So what I did is you're absolutely right. I went to the course and I looked it up and I said, okay, what's, it just spits out what types of golfers have had success here. Again, one where driving accuracy has been uh, historically very important. And a couple other things that I note out, uh, part uh, 7,200 yards in average green size, that's larger than average on the PGA tour. I believe average at the moment is about 55, 5,600, something, something like that. So I've, I've got a couple of nuggets that I can run with. And the other nugget that I can run with is that this is a par, and again, this is just the seaside course. The, uh, it's the one that has the shot, the shot tracker on it. It's the one they use the lasers for. They will play around at the plantation course. Uh, a par 70 is also noteworthy, Mark, because generally speaking, you get a, an extra or two extra par fours, and that's a different type of golfer. So I've got three little nuggets that I can run with here right out of the gate. <laughs> so what I would generally do is I would probably run right back over here to... Um, again, what I call the holy, the holy grail. And I'm going to just click on uh, strokes gained. If I can get to it here, I've got my, I've got my screen zoomed in strokes gained by tournament. And I've got my little nuggets. So what I'm actually going to do is I'll start on, um, let's do par seventies. I like par seventies because there's a lot of, there's a lot of really good ball strikers here. And we don't know who's going to play this event yet. Yeah. So I'm just going to open this up to a lot of different golfers. We don't know who's going to play, but look who's here. Webb Simpson is one of the best par four players that we have uh, on the PGA Tour in his career. And he has played a lot of rounds on par 70s. So, so because it's a par 70, you're saying there's two extra par four. So the, 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 the filter you put in was par four play. And incidentally, folks who are not watching, I see uh, Fujita, Matthew Southgate, Taylor Pendrith, Brooks Kepka, Dustin Johnson, Rory McIlroy are above Webb on the list. Those guys obviously unlikely to play at the RSM Classic, so web intriguing there. Web web certainly intriguing, and uh, the idea, yes, on on with with a couple of extra par fours, it, it tends to lend itself into some of these these ball strikers, um, players like that. What I could also do is uh, I would go to you know this stats tab here. And what I love about this mark is, um, I can sort by any number of rounds. Maybe I want to look at very recently the last four rounds, last eight rounds, last 16 rounds, or maybe I want to see golfers, uh, more longer term form, less 50 rounds, less 100 rounds and compare them against one another. And the reason that I like to use number of rounds is because you know, this mark, you know, Roy McElroy might take four months off. Uh, to compare his last four months against someone else's last four months, he might have four rounds played and someone else might have 40 rounds played. So I like to level the playing field a little bit. Of course, yeah. So what I could do, and again, we don't know who's going to play this event, but if I, if I sort by, let's say, fairways hit, because we know the driving accuracy is very important. I've got to do my radio thing. So what I'm looking at now is essentially like a spreadsheet, an Excel mm -hmm. spreadsheet, right? 
And at the top, it's got rounds played, DraftKings value off the t strokes gained off the tee approach around the green, all that sort of deal. And then there's greens and regulation, fairways hit. And all Rick did, like a Excel spreadsheet, was clicked on fairways and it organized the entire spreadsheet by fairway accuracy. And lo and behold, Ches Reeve at the top, Brendan Todd at the top. Second, he's played well here. Brian Stewart, Bryce Garnett's played well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yeah. So the way that I have this and, and it is color coded, green is good, red is bad. Uh, so it makes it easier for me to quickly identify golfers. So I have this, I know that I have this sorted by a uh, number of fairways hit. So I know these are going to be accurate players off the tee. And then I can quickly see, oh, wow. You know, Brian Stewart in his last 50 rounds, he's got, he's gained more strokes per round than any of these other top fairway hitters, except for maybe Abraham answer. So he might be someone that might be a good value if he ends up playing at the RSM classic. And this is just kind of a process that I'll go through for a few minutes. And obviously when, when the field comes out, Mark will, will know, but this is a process that, I, that process that I'll go through narrowing it down, narrowing it down, narrowing it down until I find those, those golfers that I'm, that I'm very comfortable with. Um, and this is cool too. Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd like to do an experiment maybe for three months or whatever, and just go pure data, like the money ball baseball approach. <laughs> where you don't look at names, you just pick the best ones and then you, you, you lay wages on that. Or you, you, even if you don't bet money, you just see who finishes up versus the I'm going from the gut individual like Immelman over here. <laughs> and then also um, the, 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 the possibilities here are sort of endless because you might see players... And then you have a gut instinct and you can search individual players too to just say, okay, he might not be at the top of the spreadsheet, but where does Chris Kirk fit in for argument six? You can do that, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you could not only search that. So here's, here's Chris Kirk, but every golfer has their own, uh, what I call golfer profile page. So this is what we're showing right now is Rory McIlroy's uh -huh. golfer profile page. And you can type in any golfer that has ever played around on the PGA tour. Uh, and I've got, you know, the, the strokes gain trajectory, how they've been doing over time, how they've played, um, in their last 12 rounds, 24 rounds or 36 rounds, how they put on each type of putting surface mark. I mean, this is, it, it's, it's, it, it, you're right. It's, it's endless is what it is. 20 bucks a month is a steal. And I can see why <laughs> Kyle Porter, that is spend so much time at this place. I mean, this is Disneyland for anyone. Yeah, it's really it's a nice place to get lost. Let's let's say that I spent a lot of time, and and I think that's kind of the one thing that I've done, Mark, is everything I've built is is for me. So like I love using the site. I'm like a power user of the site. So it, it you know it really it really makes me happy. <laughs> All right, I'm showing my hand for our one and done league. If they are happening to listen to this podcast, and for our one and done league, oh, oh I I wanted to say too. Going to the site, you don't necessarily have to just go with the outright bet. You can look at three golfers and go, hey, that's the matchup for this week. Looks like this guy's got the upper hand. So you just go if, on data if you want to. Exactly right. So, and, and I've done that and I've had people who email me all the time and say, hey, you know what I did is uh, I just checked uh, the five uh, Asian players that were going to be in the field. I picked who I thought was going to be the top Asian. He won. So yeah, there is there, the goal is you can slice and dice and filter and sort any way that it works for you. All right, RSM Classic 2021, you heard it here. I'm likely going with Chris Kirk unless something happens. So give me the, the lowdown on Chris there, please. Yeah, so Chris Kirk, let's see. Let's, let's pull up his golfer, his golfer profile here. So Chris Kirk, the good news for Kirk is he is jet. <laughs> say again? He's won this event in the past. He, he's won this event. Uh, this is his current uh, 2022 season. So very accurate driver of the golf ball this season. He's 54th. So in the field that we eventually get at the RSM Classic, will probably be 19th in terms of driving accuracy because not everybody is going to play that event. And you can kind of see the trends for him over time. As I show this, you can see, you can type, you can start to type or see, yeah, a lot of green. The type of golfer that Chris Kirk is generally a very good approach player. His putting has been uh, improved recently his short game's not going to get him into any trouble yeah this this is certainly someone that uh when you back that with the history around uh you know the seaside course is is certainly going to be someone of of interest that week well the grid we're looking at audio listeners is all of his recent events and strokes gained off the tee approach around the greens putting tee to green the whole thing they listed in dark green to light green and then sort of what what is 
you know, pinkish to red, which is not good. And like I look at the Arnold Palmer Invitational, um, Chris was like all green over there in every department. So it was obviously yeah. had the entire game working. And he had, what, had like a top 10, I think it was. T8 finish, yeah. So he gained across the board and finished T8 right, right there. All right, now I, I just saw you break it down. Now you just did the RSM Classic results. Let's have a go. Yeah, so here's what I'll do. This is, um, the, I'm going to go back to here. What I'll do is I'll load in Chris Kirk and you can load in his tournament. So I'll just go RSM Classic, couple of couple of clicks away. And here you go. So we've got his, his victory here uh, when it was called the McGladry in 2013. Uh, and you can see that at this event, he has... Uh, really just been piling up really good finishes, obviously a place that he, he tends to putt well, never loses strokes putting, uh, in the last handful of years here. So this is, this is just Chris Kirk at the RSM classic. Hmm. Incredible. So that's me and my pick <laughs> might change depending on how things are going, but oh man, man, how cool this is. If nothing else, if you just as a, a better, a little undecided, you just go quickly punch some stuff in and you go, okay, that's going to help me galvanize my decision because I don't gamble. You know, I'm not allowed to really because of the relationship with CBS and with the tour. But in our one and done league, it's for pride and for a whole lot of, you know, kind of um, sledging rats, you know, speaking a little trash and stuff. <laughs> and And the whole thing there with me is I always have like two or three options. And right. then the very last minute, almost before we've got to get our pick in, I'm like, yes, I'm going with this one. And it's, it's just a complete gut thing. There, there's no data involved with my decisions at all. Yeah. And it's, and that happens all the time and just something, and, and it is golf. Anything can happen over 18 holes or 72 holes, but the idea that you can say, okay, well, I have, I'm between these two guys. One has played well here. One hasn't, or one is playing better in the last six starts than the other. That might just be the thing that I need to nudge me over the finish line. All right. Two questions. One is a golf instruction thing, because I know you get to play a little golf too, when you're not doing this, which is probably not a lot of time. Um, have you built this sort of data for yourself just yet? So it's funny you say that. So uh, I, free, I'm not getting paid to say this, but I have those Arcos uh, golf sensors on my clubs. They screw into the back end of my club uh, because that mark it allows me to track every single shot that I hit. So yes, yeah, so, so in theory, uh, I do have access to every shot that I have hit as, as well. My strokes gained breakdown. Uh, I wouldn't have it any other way, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, well I ask because... It is the way of the world right now. And, and I advocate players, everyone listening to this, I'm not selling anything to get. I mean, I've, I use Mark Brody's app, um, mm. Golf Metrics, and it's, real, it's, a real, it's sort of easy, easy, the interface on the golf course. But the more data you get, in my opinion, as an instructor, I see golfers all the time that have a faulty impression of what their game is. You know, they might have sucked out of the bunkers for the last little bit because they had a few shots. But, you know, overall, things are pretty good. Yet they're working on their driver and they should be working on their chipping or something like that. But having that data, I'm sure that sort of guides your practice. Am I correct? Oh, absolutely. I've, I've learned things that I was better at than I thought and things that I was not as good at as I thought. And it was, I mean, different lengths of putts. I wasn't as good from, you know, 25 to 35 feet. And I really went out and worked on kind of my, my pace control. And I know that uh, it continues to be a, a flaw in my game is kind of uh, around the green and being able to to, to kind of hit some, some chip and runs. And, and when you have the data staring you in the face and telling you that you need to improve at it, uh, at least for me, it fuels me to go out there and start working on it. Well, you must watch one of my, it's about to come out a little, yeah, there's an Instagram putting tip, which has got to do with contact, you know, just the ball strike, that. which to me is the most important thing when it comes to long range putting. Reading greens is very important and, and, and deciding when to be it's kind of offensive and deciding when to be a little more defensive, but still when your mind and when your eye sees a line, the brain is incredible. People can't measure it, but you, you, it starts sending signals out right away to your muscles mm. to say, I've got to propel the ball this far to get it there, but you're not doing this with your fingertips. You're doing this with a prosthetic extension really mm -hmm. in the golf club. And so the brain's calculating X, but if you miss strike a putt, that doesn't jive with what your brain's seeing at all. 
and you might have had the perfect read, but you miss strike a putt, and all of a sudden, the the read is off, the speed is off, and then you're three putting, and then you're having issues. So contact to me is so important from that range. <laughs> It, it, it makes, it makes sense when you break it down like that. So I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm always uh, happy to make better contact with my, with all of my clubs, especially my putter. <laughs> uh, all right. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'd love you to give the parting shot, if anything, because we started this off by you just being the data guy and me being the other guy and yeah. we are starting to meet in the middle. Um, does this grow what you're doing here? And, and what I'd love to know is, when are we going to see a statistic like driving accuracy for argument six, where like just a couple of feet off the fairway in the first cut, to me, that's still like a fairway hit, like where unplayable balls are a different thing entirely. And, and, and that to me, because sometimes greens in regulation or strokes gain can be a bit skewed when a player is just off the fairway, but, but actually in decent position. Uh, yeah, absolutely. As, as great as golf data is right now, there are a lot of different improvements that are seemingly going to be made in the future, whether it's tracking all of the events or whether it is treating different shots differently, because right now, Mark, uh, you know, an, an, an eight foot putt, whether it is straight dead straight and up the hill is treated the same way as an eight foot putt that is going to break two feet left to right down a slippery slope. It, they're, they're treated the same way. So there are definitely, um, improvements that need to be made. So, so my parting shot is that as much as I love the data, as great as I think it is at helping make decisions and learning about different golfers and different golf courses, uh, understanding the, the limitations of the current data that we have and understanding the, the randomness uh, that is our beautiful game of, of golf is also one of the key attributes if you're, if you're uh, trying to handicap this in any sort of way. He has the thing, and, the, and it's the teacher in me. A couple things to bear in mind, folks, with the strokes gain metrics. What Rick says is absolutely true. It, it measures all eight-foot putts the same. It me measures all approach shots the same. It doesn't tell you when you're on the 17th hole and the sphincter is tightened <laughs> up and all of a sudden that's connected to your brain and your mind's whizzing all over the place. And, you know, that pressure thing has a big influence um, on, on results and that. So, but what I do want to say, though, some of the golfers' battles, Rick, are, uh, are a function of indecision. Because to me, indecision leads to tension. And tension, in my opinion, is one of the biggest wreckers of a golf swing in the history of mankind, because it, uh, tension is the enemy of a free swing. And you want to be able to swing free. So something like what you have here, even though it's just in the uh, wagering side of things, in the betting side of things, it can help you to be a bit more convicted about the final decision that you're likely to make. And, and we're certainly seeing more and more golfers embrace this, right? The whole, the whole Bryce and DeChambeau transformation was based on learning that he could be six yards more inaccurate if he was three yards longer. And some of these young guys are, are really understanding and diving into this so that they can make those committed shots when they're in between clubs or in between risk reward decisions they have to make. So you're absolutely right. Fantastic stuff, my friend. I uh, so appreciate it. It's such an awesome website. Share the handle again for folks and please tell them where they can find you on social media. Absolutely. So the website is rickrungood.com and easy enough, uh, you can find me on Twitter at rickrungood. He's the man. I appreciate your time and thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>